Hello and welcome to Code Tutorials. In this video, we're going to show you how to make a restaurant website using the Laurent WordPress theme. At the moment, we're looking at the theme's landing page. It provides us with highlights of what's in store. The first section displays all the options this theme has in terms of home page layouts. There are nine different options and you can pick based on your needs and stylistic preferences. When you hover over any one of them, you get a tiny preview of how that home page looks. The preview scrolls through the entire page top to bottom. Another thing we can see right away is that we have the option of building or customizing the site using WP Bakery or Elementor page builders, but we're going to talk more about that later. Moving on, Laurent is a fully responsive WordPress theme, and in this section we can see how it would look on different devices. It has all the settings that will make it look good, no matter which device your visitors use to access your site. And the great thing about responsiveness and being mobile-friendly, it can help you with search engine rankings. Then, we have a glimpse of the inner pages that are included in the theme's demo content, like the gallery page, coming soon, contact us, and more. Alright, what I'll be working with today is this, the main home. Let's take a peek at what it looks like. I'm going to take you through all its elements and show you how to work with them. If we scroll down the page, we can see that everything from the landing page preview is here as well. We'll be going through each of these sections during the course of the video. I'll explain everything you need to know to make an amazing site of your own. So let's start. And we'll do that by importing the demo content. When you install and activate the theme, what you need to do next is import the demo content. Demo content will be our sort of framework that we'll build on. It saves us from doing everything from scratch. We'll start by going to the WordPress admin dashboard. That is basically the backend interface of your site. This is where all our settings are found, so we'll be in here quite frequently. After you install the theme and activate all the recommended plugins, you will be able to see these new options on the side. The Laurent dashboard with the system info and import options and the Laurent options where the theme's global options are found. But we set out to find the import option and for that we need the Laurent dashboard. Import. When it opens, the first thing we see is that we need to register the theme which activates your theme copy. That's done by adding your purchase code in the purchase code field and setting your contact email below that. Then just click on register theme. And when that's done, we can click on the import option again. Same option, different view. That's because registering the theme has opened new options to us. So in this select demo to import field, we can pick which demo to import. This means we can choose whether to import the demo built with WP Bakery, that's this one simply called Laurent, or we can pick the one built with Elementor, which you'll recognize from having Elementor in the name. I'm going to go for Elementor. Then, in the Select Import option, you can pick whether to import the entire demo content or just some parts of it. Since I want to import the complete demo content, I'll pick all in this dropdown. Then just go to Import. And OK, we're sure. The import may take some time, so wait until you see the text with Import is completed at the bottom. Once that's done, we can see what a difference the demo content makes. This is what your homepage would look like without it. Now that we have the demo content, I can just refresh this page and the content I imported will appear. And here is our homepage now, looking much better, right? All the elements and sections we saw on the live theme demo are now on our site as well. Everything is here and looks good. So the next thing I want to do is set this page as my site's front page. That's done in the back and we need to go to settings, then reading. Then under your home page displays, we can pick between having our latest posts or a static page as our front page. Since blogging isn't my focus here, I want to keep the static page option selected. Once that's settled, I just need to pick which page will be my home page in this drop down. You can pick literally any page you have as your front page by selecting it here. But I'm going to be using the one called Main Home for my restaurant site. So I'm going to keep this set the same. OK. When you've selected your front page, you need to save changes here. And that's it. 
Now, all the pages your site has, and uh, right now that includes the demo pages, are located here in Pages, All Pages. We can see from this gray text next to each page that they are built using Elementor. What I'm looking for is my home page, the one I just set as the site front page. There it is. Its name is Main Home, and the gray text here marks it out as front page, and it's built with Elementor just like all the others. Now I want to open it for editing, and I'm going to do that by clicking on this Edit with Elementor option. If this is your first run-in with Elementor, then I'll just briefly mention that the page building elements are all here on the left in this Elementor sidebar. And on the right, that's the brilliant bit, we can see our page front and any changes we make will be immediately visible. Even with this, it's good practice and I wholeheartedly recommend it, you should keep a tab open with your home page front end. Mostly to refresh and check occasionally. Sometimes things can still get a bit jumbled, so it's good to make sure your building is on track. Also, it's going to be useful for tracking our work on customizing the header and footer areas, since those are set using the themes options and not Elementor. So, starting with the logo. In fact, I'm going to start customizing my homepage from the top, meaning I'll replace this header logo and then go through all of this, which is the header area. This is our main menu, and here we have a side area opener and the side area itself. So, starting with the logo. You can find the logo settings under Laurent Options Logo. We can see here that the current logo is actually an SVG and not a typical image. Now, don't worry, I don't expect you to know how to make scalable vector graphics. SVGs perhaps fall into more advanced design knowledge. If you know how to make them, you can set the path here. You can do that by changing the logo source type here. But it's far easier to just add an image instead. I'll start by removing the demo logo images to make room for my own. OK, now I can upload my logo. Just a sec so I can find the image I prepared. There it is. OK. Then select image. And now I'm going to save the change and go check the front to see if the new logo is there. And there it is. Looks good. I uploaded this image under logo image default. Since my logo is going to look good on both dark and light backgrounds, it's not too pale or too dark to be indistinguishable, so I'll use the same image for all the other logo variations. I'm uploading this image for every logo variation to make sure that my logo will appear throughout the site wherever it should. By replacing all images, I'm ensuring that none of the demo logos will show up somewhere. When you're finished replacing the images, click on Save Changes. OK, now we can see what's next in our header customization. OK, logo's done and we can take a look at the main menu now. But before we start customizing the menu itself, we need to consider the type of header we are using. Let me show you what I mean. Go to the back in Laurent Options, then find the header. This is where all our general header settings are. At the very top, under Header Type, you can see that the standard header type is enabled by default. That's the type we've been looking at all along. In terms of options we have available here, as soon as we pick which header to customize, we can choose its header behavior. Right now, it's fixed on scroll, but if we go to the front and scroll, it doesn't appear. This means there is an exception set for this page. You can make exceptions to every global theme setting by using specific page settings. So, even though the home page doesn't have a fixed header behavior, all your other pages will be fixed on scroll because it's set in global theme settings. Another thing we can pick is the header skin. There is a choice between light and dark. The default one that's on now is dark, but you can change that. Then we have the option of enabling the top bar. If you need additional space for something above the header, then by enabling the top bar you get space here. It's usually used if you need to add more information to the header and need room to do so. Then we can choose whether the menu area will be in grid or not. Every website can accommodate full width and grid content display. Grids for desktop screens are usually between 1100 and 1300 pixels. And you can pick what yours will be if you enable the grid. Grids make everything more compact since they limit the content to a smaller space. But with my current menu, I don't need it as my menu is pretty neat and centered already, so the grid won't change much. 
Now, we can choose a background color. That's if you want a uniform color for your header background here. But if we open the color picker, we can see that we actually have a background color already. It's white. You can use any color you want, and when you set a zero here, it makes your header totally transparent. And then you get this, where the page background peeks through. If you want a solid header, you need to set the number 1 here. That will make your chosen background color visible. Then, if you have a solid header, you might want to give it a shadow by enabling this option here. But I don't think it makes much sense for me with a transparent header, so I'll skip it. After that, we can pick if we'll have a menu area border or not. This is set as enabled by default. As you can see, enabling this option has given us a visible border underneath our menu. You can turn it off if you like, but personally I think it goes quite well with the whole Art Deco look. Which is why I'll just change the color. When using a color picker, you can use the sliders to set your color, or you can type in the color's hex code if you know it. I know which color I want, so I'll simply type it in here. OK, now save changes. And let's see how it looks on the front. There it is. Another thing we can change is the header height. To do that, you need to add a custom value in pixels. But when I take a look at the front, the default height suits me and makes everything look neat and symmetrical, so I won't be changing it, but you can set any number here if you like. Then we can set a menu area side padding. It will give us some space to the left and right of the menu. If you add padding, it will bring the menu items closer together to create the space. Generally, I'm happy with the current look, so it can stay. Oh, and this is good to know. You can choose the menu area position using this option here. Right now, it's set to center, and that's what's keeping my menu square in the middle, which I like as it makes my header look balanced and elegant, so it stays. In the Enable Skewed section, you can make your header slant to the side. I don't think an asymmetrical header will fit with where I'm going with the design, so I won't be enabling this. Now we get to the sticky header settings. Sticky headers are pretty popular and really handy to have. So if you pick this for your header behavior, then you can use this field to set the scroll amount. That's the length of space users will need to scroll before the sticky header appears. Just set the custom value in pixels here. All the following options are actually the same as we just saw with the standard header, like transparency, background color, border color, and so on. And we get the same options for the fixed header. But the main menu settings are interesting. We have some of the usual customization options like background color, transparency, and so on. But we can pick the menu font, so you can switch this with some custom typography solutions if you like. And we can set different things, including different fonts for different menu levels. So you can make your second level menu items like these here a different font, color, or style, whatever you like. And you can do the same for your third level menu items, if you have them. Those will be these here. So you can make each level different if you want to. Of course, you might not want to have that many menu levels at all, but the options are there should you choose to use them. Now that we've seen what settings we have for our current header and menu, let me show you the other header types, so you can know what your options are. You can pick between four different header types, and I'll show you what each one looks like using the live theme demo. I'm going back to the landing page, and we can look from there. Here in the homepage display, the Fine Dining homepage, let's open it up. Here we have the vertical header type. With it, the header is positioned along the left side of the page, and the menu is also vertically aligned, with its items neatly listed out. We have the exact same menu with all the same items. And in the back, oops, that's this option. The vertical header type. You can switch to that one simply by selecting the little box here. Then the next option, here in Split Screen Showcase. This is the minimal header type. With this header variation, we get the logo on the left and a menu opener on the right. When you click it, you get this full screen menu view with these big and bold items. And if you click on them, they unfold to show the second level menu items. So you can navigate just as easily. And if choosing it in the back, that's this header type, minimal. And the final option we have is the bottom header type. And we can see it on the full screen showcase home. 
and with it, as the name suggests, our header is placed at the bottom, and the menu items unfold upwards when we hover over them. And that's it. Let me just close all these tabs up, I won't be needing them anymore. Now that we've seen all our options for header types and gone through the most important header settings, we can take a look at the main menu. That's this here. I'm going to show you how to customize these menu items and menus in general. To do that, you need to go to Appearance, then Menus. The first thing you need to do here is select which menu you want to edit. We'll be working on the main menu, so you'll need to choose that one. When it opens, you can see that it has a lot of items. Really a lot. That's because of all the demo content. It has so many items, it's easier for me to create a new menu from scratch than to try to reuse the old one. So you can just go to create a new menu here. Then pick a name for it, like my menu, and then create menu. And before we start adding items, I'll tick the main navigation and mobile navigation for my display location. I may have flicked through the original menu quickly, but it had the same display locations. And if you're making a new menu to replace one that already exists, then you want to copy its display locations so it shows up in the same spots. Now I can start adding pages, starting with main home, which is my front page. And I want to change how it's shown, its label. Make it say just home. Then I'm going to add about us. And um, let's see, a contact us page. Add that as well. I'll change its label so it only says contact. OK. Then I want to add one of these portfolio list pages so I can add a gallery there and showcase the restaurants, dishes and drinks. And I'll change it to gallery. There it is. OK. I could also add a... Hmm. A shop page could be useful. Sometimes restaurants sell branded cookware and mugs, even t-shirts or fancy spice mixes, things like that. And I could also have a... Well, a blog's always useful, so a blog page. And it can be blog standard. And of course, rename the label so it's just blog in the menu now. I think that's all I need. Save menu. Now let's refresh the front end to see how the new menu looks. Okay, there it is. A bit wider than the original, but it looks nice. And you can see now that when you're on a certain page, it has this effect of underlining it. You get something similar when you hover over the other pages, but as soon as you move away, the effect disappears. It remains fixed underneath the page you're currently viewing. It tells your visitors where they are in case they get distracted by all the delicious food. And that's most of our header sorted. The only thing we have left is the side area opener. Clicking on it opens the side area where we can see some text and the old logo that's left over. The side area is built with widgets, so to customize it, you need to go to Appearance, Widgets. Then find the widget area for the side area. When you open it, you can see all the widgets it contains. So when you want to customize it, start from the first one. In this case, the image widget that's used to add the logo. Of course, if you want to, you can also add more widgets. They can be the same or something completely different. And each widget has the option to delete it, which is how you can remove it from the widget area. But I want to customize the existing widget, so I'll just start by replacing the old logo image. And I'll upload a copy of my new logo image. I have one for the side area. Generally, logo images should be twice the size of the display dimensions, so keep that in mind when choosing where to upload your logo. OK, now add to widget. And I'll change this link so it leads to my homepage. That, here, copy, and paste. If you prefer, you can omit the link entirely, and save. Now let's check the front. Refresh. There's my new logo now. Since we sorted that out, we can take a look at the text, i.e. widgets underneath it. The first thing we have is a separator widget. This widget serves to help us adjust the spacing between the logo and text. It has a custom width of 18 pixels and it gives us this free space here. Essentially, it works as a sort of buffer, keeping the image and text widgets from being too close. So you can increase or decrease the space by changing the pixel value. Next, we have the text widget. And I'm going to change it to match my restaurant's name. Then, this is where you will enter your own restaurant's address, just type over it. 
and you can replace the link if you click on the little pencil to edit. Same goes for the phone number and the opening hours. I'll save now because of the name change and check to see if it's okay in the front. Let's see. Okay, welcome to Avalon Fine Dining. With this, our header is done. Before we start in on customizing our page content, I'd like to go through some general theme options with you. Let me first thin out these tabs. Okay. Now we need to go to Laurent Options General. You can choose a font family to use on your entire site. You can add additional fonts if the current selection doesn't work for you. Then you can adjust the style and weight of your chosen font and choose its subset too. Then the first main color. This is the color that will be predominant on your theme, meaning it will be most present on your site. We can see the hex code for our main color here, but we can change it using the color picker to select the color manually or type in its hex code. The default first main color is this golden yellow that you can see throughout the site. Then we have the page background color. The default color is white, but thanks to the theme's design, that's been customized throughout so we have different backgrounds on the front. You also have the option to add a background image. If you don't want to have a single color background, you can insert an image instead. You can do this by uploading an image via the button here. And you can choose whether that image will repeat throughout your site. If you enable this, your background image will act as a wallpaper for your site's pages. Since I want to keep the original elegant design, I'm going to skip both these options. Next, you can change the text selection color. I'm going to show you what that is on the page in the front end. This is it. When you select a section or word of text, it will be marked by your chosen text selection color. So if you don't like this gray we have now, you can change it. Oh, another interesting option we have here is to choose the width of our content when it's set in grid. If you recall, I mentioned earlier that grids for desktop screens are usually between 1100 and 1300 pixels. As you can see here, ours is currently set to 1300, but you can make that much smaller if you want. So let me show you what this means in the front end. All content that is not screen wide is in grid, and it has a width of 1300 pixels. So from this side to this side, we have 1300 pixels. The entire width of the screen I'm using is 1920 pixels, and that width encompasses our grid as well as the spaces to the edge of the screen. So everything that is not full width is in grid, and you can pick how wide that grid will be using the drop down menu. Another option I want to draw your attention to here is the grid lines and page background. We can see that there are four lines set to display. On the front, those are. Give me a sec. Here. It might be a bit hard to see depending on the video quality you have on. Our grid lines are these four thin lines in the background. It's a pretty subtle detail and you can see it on your page in the sections that have transparent backgrounds. However, sections like this slider have a background image so the lines can't be seen. If you'd like, you can change the color of these lines. That's done here using the color picker. I'll change mine now and make them darker. I know which color I want, so I'll just type in the hex code. There. Now save. And let's check the front. Okay, the lines with their new color are there. The darker shade makes them seem finer and more delicate. Of course, I know we all have different tastes, so if this isn't the look you want to go for, you can turn the grid lines off entirely. That's done using this option here. But since I'm keeping mine, I also want to change one more thing. Those are these two lines on the sides. I want to make them match the color I set for my menu area border, which is a pinkish color compared to the yellow that's the theme default. So I want all three lines to match. I'm going to type in my color's hex code to do that. And there it is. OK, save. Refresh. OK, the change took effect and now all these lines are the same color so they match. In terms of other interesting options we have here, there's the preload pattern image. You'd use this if you want to add an image that will be displayed while your page loads. This is useful if you have to use a slower server or expect a lot of traffic that will slow down your load time. Just make sure that the image you use is 1920 by 1100 pixels so that your screen will be covered. 
Another option I want to draw your attention to is the show back to top button. This option is already enabled by theme default and I suggest you keep it on. Let me show you what it looks like on the front end. That's this button here. It's there to let visitors return to the top of a page without having to scroll all the way up or swipe back up for ages on mobile. Another thing I recommend you keep enabled is the responsiveness option. This option alone won't magically make your pages responsive, you still need to make appropriate adjustments elsewhere in your settings, but turning this option on now will let you work on page responsiveness later on. Then we have the field where you can add some custom code if you have any. If you know how to code or have someone who can help you, this is where you'd add code to customize your site beyond what the dashboard and theme options allow. And last but not least, the Google API. If you want to show a Google Map on your site, you need to register for a Google Maps API key. I'll leave you a link in the description to a separate video tutorial with more details on how the Google Maps API works and a step-by-step -step explanation on how to generate your Google Maps API key. So if you opt to do that, you'll need to add your API to this field. And that's all I wanted to show you in the general options. Now we can get back to our page. This one, our home page. We are going to start by opening it in the back end. So we need our view of all pages. And click directly on your page name to open it. Here it is. When you scroll down, you'll be able to see the general page settings. A lot of these are identical to the options we saw under the themes global options. However, the thing here is, any changes you make to the page settings will apply just to that one page. So, you can make exceptions to the number of lines you use, or their color, or the grid lines on the side, anything. And that change will be visible only on the page where you set it. Like this, we have no behavior set for the header behavior. But in the themes global options, the header behavior is set as fixed. And specific page settings trump global settings, so no behavior. Here's another example. The menu background color is different. The one used here is plain black. All zeros is the hex code for black. Hmm, we covered that, so I don't want to spend more time on these options since they're already familiar. So let's go back to our page, open for editing in Elementor. Since I opened it way back at the start, I'll refresh it so my new menu and logo and so on are visible. Okay, here we are. Now we can take a look at our first section. When you click on it to select, the settings for that element will open in Elementor sidebar menu. This also helps me know which precise element I'm customizing, as the options include the title on top. So I know I'm working with the slider evolution, which is a separate plugin, but Elementor makes it easier to add sliders made in slider evolution to our pages. The element lets you choose which slider you want to insert. But in order for a slider to show here, you need to make it in the slider evolution. Of course, it's far easier to customize an existing one which is already set on your page. So, to customize a slider, you need to go to the dashboard menu, then find the slider evolution settings. When it opens, you will be able to see all the sliders you have, here under search modules. I'm looking for the one we have on our page. Here, click on the little pencil to open it for editing. Give it a sec to load. Okay, the first thing I want to do here is replace the background image with one of my own. You can do that by going here to slide options. Make sure background is selected. Then use the media library button to upload your new image. I have one prepared. What you should keep in mind is, if you want the image to display across the full width of the screen, its dimensions have to be at least 1920 by 1100 pixels. Okay. Now insert and save the change. I'll just check the front. Refresh and my new image is there. Good. Now this is one of the benefits of customizing an existing slider. When you replace an image, the new one simply inherits all the same settings the old one had. So it still has the same parallax effect, the same slider behavior and so on. And you probably noticed that the font over the slide doesn't look the same in the back end and the front end. That's because Slider Evolution comes with a limited number of fonts. 
The one we're using for Laurent isn't included by default. It's actually added using custom CSS, but you don't have to worry about that. As you saw, it will show just right on your front end. Now I want to have this image front and center at all times, so I'm going to remove the other slides in the slider to achieve that. You can add or remove slides by going to the slider dropdown. We can see here that this slider has three slides and there's a tiny preview when you hover over one. If you want to edit any of them, just click on it to select and it will open like the current one. However, if you want to delete them like I do, simply click on the little bin icon. Confirm that you're sure and that's it. I'll also delete the third one. There. OK. All gone. Now save. And refresh the front. OK. My slide number one is here. We can see that the navigation arrows on the side are gone, since there is nowhere to navigate to. Same goes for the pagination that was at the bottom of the slider. I mentioned that this image has a parallax effect. So now I want to show you how that's set. You can see the effect when you scroll. The image moves at a different pace than the rest of the page. It's creating an illusion of depth, so it can seem like the image is sinking into the top of the next section. To set this effect, or to turn it off entirely if you prefer, you need to open the on-scroll settings. You need to still be in slider options for this. Then, in the section for parallax and 3D settings, you have this drop-down menu. It shows depth percentages, meaning how much overlap you can set on your image so you get the illusion of depth. You can use the same menu to turn off the effect by picking the no parallax option. I'm happy with the current look, so I'll leave the effect on with the same percentage that it had originally. Even though I didn't change anything, I'll save just in case. Saving your work after a change is a good habit to form and I highly recommend it. Now, the next thing I want to do is change the text that's shown on my slide. Starting from the top, here. You can select a layer, and this is a layer, in Slider Evolution by double-clicking. It's a bit like Elementor in that respect. Selecting something opens the settings for it in the sidebar. And now I can just type over this text to replace it with my own content. When your text is set, you can customize it further using the style settings. I'll just switch the color and make it white. I can select it from here or use the manual color picker or type in the hex code. When you're done, confirm your choice using the checkmark button and save. Let's check it. Refresh. My new white color text is here. Then, oops. Then I want to replace this text in the middle. You can see when I hover over it that each word is set as a separate text layer. This is done so each word can be animated on its own. Basically, you can give each layer a different animation then. Now, say you want to have two words instead of three here. I'll delete the first one. Actually, before that, I want to show you what I meant by each word having its own animation effect. I'll refresh, keep an eye on the text. There. Each word fades in on its own. If they were in the same layer, they'd appear as a group. OK, let me get back to deleting my layer. I'm going to do that by right-clicking and selecting Delete in this drop-down menu. Done. Now I can edit these two. Double-click to select. And let's change it to Elegant and make the other one Dining. And save. Let's see how that looks on the front. OK, things have gone a bit out of whack, but that's completely normal. I changed the number of layers and the length of the words, so now I need to adjust their position. And that's very simply solved. Select the layer you want to move and use your keyboard arrow keys to move it. And I'm going to widen the box for my layers so the letter spacing is bigger. And shift a bit more. OK, save. And let's see what it looks like now. Needs a bit more adjustment. So back to the back end. Select and move using the arrow key. Save. Refresh. Better, but still not there yet. The first one needs to go even further left, and I'll adjust the second one so both are centered between these graphics on the side. I realize you might think this part boring or nitpicky, but the fact of the matter is, this is a realistic reflection of the process. 
you will likely be doing the same minute shifts for your site as well. This is why saving things often and being patient are great things to do. Also, checking your front end often. All highly recommended. Okay, my text needs a bit more moving. Let's see. Okay, and a bit here. Save. And refresh. Okay, looking good. Now that I've done that, I can adjust the text color to match the layer above. Select, Style, and under Text Color, I want white. Okay, now the other one too. There, white. Okay, don't forget to save. And let's check the front. Okay, good. All my text is white. Now, another thing I want to change is this text here. I want to customize the content. So, double click so we get the editor view. Then I can select the old text and type over it to add my new content. When you're done, save the changes. And check your page front to see how everything lines up. Okay, good. This layer won't need to be moved. So, with that done, I can replace these graphics on the side so that I have everything in white. Now, these two are actually added as image layers, which means I can't edit them directly. But I can replace them with my own images. I'll do that by adding a new image layer. I need the image option and I'll add it from the WordPress library. And upload a new image. Then select. Choose your image. And then insert it. Okay, now my new image is set up in the corner, so I want to copy the old one's position. You can do that by copying its settings. Let me show you. Select the old image. Then go to Size and Positions. That's still in Layer Options. Then here in the section with Position and Size, you have the alignment. We can see its center both horizontally and vertically. We can see the precise position coordinates below. And another important setting here is this layer align that's set to scene. This means that our slide and its layers can be displayed across the full width of the screen instead of being limited to the grid, which they would be if layer area were enabled. And also, you want to check if the section below with responsive behavior is off. You want all of these options off because the theme has its own settings for responsiveness and those may clash with the plugin settings. Also, turning them off will make manipulating layers easier. They're not on. They're off. Good. So, now I can select my new image and apply these same settings to it. Starting with the alignment. Then the layer align. And responsive stays off. OK. Now, I'm just going to drag the new image over the old one. And it's there-ish. I'll adjust it further using the keyboard arrow keys. You can manage more delicate moves that way. Let me see. OK, now let's save. And go to check the front. Looks good. Now I can go back, oops, and delete the old image so it doesn't weigh down my page. That's done by finding it in this list below the slide. And it's this one. Before I delete it, I'll just check what kind of animation's on it. So, layer options, animation. And you can play out the animation here. Ah, pop up smooth. Okay, now that I know that, I can delete it. You can simply select and delete using a keyboard key. There. Now I can set the same animation for my new image. Select and animation, incoming, pop ups, and pop up smooth. I'll set the start at 510 milliseconds to match the old layer. After that, refresh the front. OK, I have a new white graphic with the same animation here. Now I can replace the other one on the right. Mm, I'll just click on content so I can copy the image layer I already sorted out on the left side. So select the image, right click, and then just click to duplicate. Since that created a second image on top of the first one, I'll just drag it over to the right using my mouse. OK, thereabouts. Then I can adjust it using the arrow keys. And there. Now I can delete the old image underneath this one. After that, save changes. Then refresh so we can check the front. 
Okay, everything is there as it should be. Everything is matching white, except this button. It's added to the slide as a shortcode. It gets its style from the theme. You can customize it here by changing the attributes and their values in the shortcode. And you can replace the button text by typing over it. And you can change the button target by replacing this link here. And that's it for our slider. We can move on to the next section. The section after the slider, we need Elementor for this bit. Let's go back to that view. Okay. This whole row is a section in Elementor. You can edit the section by clicking on it here on this keypad looking icon. Okay, got it. When you click to edit something, you'll get its setting opened in Elementor sidebar on the left. If you want to add a new empty section, you can do that using the plus icon here. Click and see. New section where you can add elements. And if you click on the plus icon within the section, you can pick the structure of your section, meaning the number of columns you'll have in it. So you can choose between having one column or more, depending on your needs. Now that we covered that, I'll delete this section, we don't need it. The section we're about to customize has only one column. So you can edit a section and you can edit a column. Columns are edited by clicking on this table icon, this gray square icon. And it opens the column setting on the left. Before we start in on that, we can see that there's a space above the element, which means there's some sort of padding in our section. And we have a width adjustment on our column. When we open the section options, we have this content width option. You can use this option to make a column wider or narrower. Simply drag the slider or type in a pixel value. Then you can do this. See? Okay, I'll just return this to 480 now. And we can head over to the Advanced tab. At the very top, we have the margin and padding settings. That's what we came here to see. This is where you have 160 pixels creating this space on top of our element. The value we have now is set in pixels, but you can change that to percentages or M's. If you keep the pixels, then this space they make will be the same on all screen sizes. Now when we click on the element, it opens for editing on the left. We can see from the title on the top that we're working with a section title element. If you want to add a new element to a section, you can click here to open the element menu. You can search for it using a keyword or scroll down the options until you find the one you need. Once you have, select and drag it to the column where you want it to be. Like this. This is just an example, I'll delete it. You can right click to get these options. Okay, this element we have, the section title, includes several handy customization options. We can add some custom CSS to start with, or change its position. It's set in the center, but we can move it to the left or the right. The holder side padding, it's easier to show than to explain. I'll give it 10% for example. And you get this. The holder side padding pushes the content of the element inward so it's narrower. If you choose to use this, I recommend percentages instead of pixels so it can change proportionally to the screen it's viewed on. Then we come to the options for adding content. Starting with the tagline, our story. Here it is. Then the title, about us. And finally, the text. Since I have some placeholder text here, I'll replace it with something more meaningful. Give me a sec to type it in. There, now my restaurant story isn't in Latin. I can go to save this change. And let me refresh the front to see. Okay, good. Next, if you want to have a button underneath all this, you can add one. Just set the text for your button and the style, and it will appear under the text. The styles are outlined, simple and solid. Outline is the one we have on the slider, this one. Simple would be just text serving as a button, no outlines. And solid would be, well, a solid filled in button. After this, we have the title style options. You can choose anything between H1 and H6. Right now we have H1 for the title and I want to keep it that way. If you want to change the color of your title, you can do that here with the color picker. And the decoration pattern. That's actually this. These graphic elements on the sides. If you like, you can disable them. But I think they're neat, so I'm keeping them. You can also turn off the animation that the decorations have. Let me show you what I mean on the front. 
Etsy, they are set to appear after the content loads. After that, we have the Enable Title Wrap option. It's disabled because we have a pretty short title so we don't need it. But if I turn it on, we get this. Our title is wrapped so it's not all in one line, which is useful if you decide to put a lengthy title here. Also, if you have a long title, you can use this, Position of Line Break. You can choose after which word your title will move into a new line. I don't have a lot of words, so I'll work with what I have to show you. And set 1 here. And there. The line breaks after the first word. But my title is too short and I don't think I need this. And disable line break for smaller screens. It's set to no. This allows our title to have breaks on smaller screens so it can fit the different space neatly. If, for whatever reason, you don't want to do this, you can set it to yes and your titles won't have breaks on smaller screens. If you do this, make sure to check how your titles look on mobile phones and tablets. Ok, then in text style we have the options for this text here. It has a P tag for paragraph and you can change it if you want. Then the text color, we have the color picker if we want to change it. And we can change the font size, line height, font weight, and the text top margin. If we want our text to have more space above it, then we can give it a top margin, like 50 pixels. And there, you get this additional space between the text and the title. Moving on, we have the button style options. If you choose to add a button here, you'll need these options. This is where you'd set the target link and then decide whether it will open in the same window or a new one. And pick the button color and hover color, as well as the button top margin. Ok, I'll update now, just in case. And take a look at my page to check if everything is ok there. Alright, that's our section title sorted. After that, we have a section with images. In the back, that's set up by putting three columns in the section settings. When we click on it, we can see that the first column is occupied with a single image element. In fact, all three columns have this element. To replace any of the images, simply click on the image in the sidebar. I'll upload a new image now to replace the demo, this one. Ok, and insert media. There it is. Update. And let's check the front. Ok, it's there. In terms of options, image size is set to false so it keeps its original dimensions. You can type in any of the other options to change its size. Or you can use a size in pixels, you'll need two values, one for width, one for height. I'll explain the next option when we reach the middle column, it'll make more sense then. Then enable image shadow, if you want to give your image a shadow. For me, with a black background, it doesn't make much sense. And the ornamental background, that's a neat one, let me show you. When we switch to yes, we get this golden lattice work in the back. I like it, but I have the same pattern in my middle column, so it might be overkill. Then we have the image behavior. Right now, that's none. But we can change it to open light box, which will open a larger version of the image. Or open custom link. Or zoom, let me show you that one. When you hover over an image now, it zooms in gently. Then grayscale. That one gives you a black and white filter effect. And moving on hover, this makes the image seem to follow a user's mouse when they hover over it. Ok, then we have the appear effects. Right now it's from top, so let's try from left. There. And it can appear from right as well. And we can switch it off entirely by changing it to none. But I'll keep the original appear effect from top. And update. Before we get into the middle column, I want to change the image for the one on the right. Just a moment, let me find it. Ok. Insert media. We have the exact same options here, so I won't be going through them again. I'll just update to save the change. And quickly refresh the front to make sure it's ok. Alright. And now we can focus on the middle column. It has the same single image element we have in the other two columns, except in this case the image is not uploaded as a file. Instead, it's added as SVG. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. It's used when you want to add an XML based vector image. Until you see what it looks like on the page, all you can see of SVG in the back is this code, let's call it. 
and this code defines the lines, their positions, angles, thicknesses, and so on. So, unless you're already familiar with SVG, I suggest you don't change anything here except the color. You can recognize which of these is the code for color thanks to the hashtag it includes. I'll replace the default color with the pink one I'm using for the grid lines on my site. And since I know it's hex code, I'll just type it in. OK, there. Update. Now this graphic matches the lines on the sides. And the change is there on the front. Good. So that's it for this section. Moving on, we have a testimonials section next. It has two columns. Unlike our previous section, our columns now contain different elements. On the left, we have a testimonial and on the right, an image. Now, the testimonials are a bit like the slider revolution, in the sense that you add their content elsewhere and then insert individual testimonials using the element or slider. And then insert individual testimonials using the element or sidebar. In terms of options you get in the sidebar, there's the type. You can replace it with one of the other options using this drop-down menu. Then skin. The default is dark, but you can change it to light. And get this look. I like the original better, so let me restore this to default. Then we have the number of testimonials option. This is where you can type in a number that will determine how many testimonials can be shown. And below that, in category, you can choose which category of testimonials will show, in case you have multiple categories. But, if you only have a few testimonials for a given category, then you might not need to set a number above to limit how many will be shown. Now, let me show you how to make a testimonial. Let's go to the dashboard. We need the Laurent Testimonials option. OK, here we have the testimonials that came as part of the demo content. And here we can see their categories. What I want to do now is make a new category, so I need testimonial categories. I'll start by setting a name for my new category, like Avalon Testimonials, then copy the name for the slug field too, and then just add new testimonials category. Then we can go back to our testimonials view and click on add new to create a new testimonial. A single testimonial looks like this in the backend. As you can see, there are only a few fields to fill. Start by naming it. Say Avalon T1. Then here on the right is where you can set which category your testimonial belongs to. I'll tick the category I just made, Avalon Testimonials. Then here in the text field you can set what someone said about your restaurant. Make sure that the quote you're putting in your testimonial is something flattering, of course. Let me just finish this up. OK. Then the author is the person who provided the testimonial, so you can set their name here. And author position. If the person who gave the testimonial has a title or role you want to point out. Once you've done all that, you can go to publish. Now let's get back to our testimonials list view. And here we can see the testimonial we just made. Next to it is its category. And I'll make two more so I can replace all the three demo testimonials with my own. OK, there they are. My three testimonials and they are all in the same category. Now I'm just going to refresh this page. I'm doing this so Elementor registers a new testimonials category which I can then add in my element settings. Let me just scroll down first. Whoops. There we are. Now I can type in the slug for my new category which will make Elementor display the appropriate testimonial singles in the slider. Update. And let's check the front. Refresh. OK, there they are, my three new testimonial singles. Now we have a few more options here in slider settings. Those include enable slider loop, which lets the slider loop back on itself. Having it set to yes means there is no finish line for the testimonials. When we reach the last one, the slider will start displaying slides from the beginning. Then enable slider autoplay is also set to yes. It will make your slider start to move automatically, so users won't have to click to start the loop. Then the slider autoplay duration. Its default value is 5000 milliseconds. That's the time that a single slide will be displayed before switching to the next one. And the slide animation duration is the length of time a slide takes to load up and be fully shown. The default value, which I'll be keeping, is 600 milliseconds. 
It's barely noticeable on its own, but it gives individual slides a bit of a lag so the content seems to fly in instead of appearing abruptly. Now, the slider navigation arrows are disabled. If we turn them on, we get these, but I don't think we need them now because we have the slider pagination enabled. That's this option below. If we turn that off, we can no longer tell how many slides there are in the loop. So I'll restore it to yes because I want people to know that there's more than one testimonial here. And that's it for the testimonials. Now on the right we have a column with a single image element. Since we saw what options we have for this element, I'll just replace the image without going through all the settings again. Let me find the one I need. OK. And insert media. Now update. And refresh. There we are. That's this section done. Underneath it, we have another two column section. And this one has another single image element. So I'll replace the image right away. OK. That one. And insert. Update. Let's check it. Good. Now, before we take a look at the second column, I want to show you something. This section has an inner section nestled within it, and we can modify this inner section by clicking here. This opens the settings for it, and I want to go to the Advanced tab to show you, and the Laurent Grid, uh, we can see this inner section is in Grid. You can add an inner section to any regular section you like. You add it the same way you would any other element, by finding it in the Elements menu. Then click here and go to Advanced and you can enable the grid here. So you can have a full width section and within it you can nest an inner section that will be in grid. This will make the content of your page section fit those 1300 pixels we have for our grid. The point is, you should be aware that there are a lot of options for maneuvering and positioning your elements on the page. Ok, now that we know that, we can edit the second column in our inner section. It's another section title. The settings we have for it are the same ones we saw already. Except now, we also have a button. But we already saw the settings for that too. So now I'll just replace the placeholder text with my own content. Now the tagline can stay, it works for me. But I'll replace the title and have it say, see our specials. Ok, update. And let's see it. Looks good. Next, I'll replace the text which is currently lorem ipsum. Give me a moment to type it in. OK, there we are. And then update. Now let's check the page. There it is, my new text. Now when we considered the button options earlier, we didn't have a button to look at on the page. But we can have another go now. The button text is what your button will say. In this case, view all. Adding this text makes the button appear on the page. If you don't add any text, there'll be no button. Then you can pick your button style. Switch it to simple, like this. You get this minimalist look. Or switch it to solid, so you get a filled in button with a solid color. I'll restore mine to outline, which is the default. And we can look at the button styles. This is where you pick the link for your button and decide how this link will open. The button gets its color palette from the theme, but you can change that here. And finally, you can customize its top margin. If we increase this number, we get this. A lot more space. Yeah, it's a bit too much. I'll put 50 back. And update. Then we can take a look at the page front end to check if everything is OK. Moving on. Our next section is a menu. Let's see it here. Right away we can see there are several columns here. We have one at the top with a section title element. Then we have an inner section with two more columns. So, starting from the top, our section title element contains a tagline, special selection, and the title from our menu. We don't have any text added here. Our section title is acting as a sort of menu title. Then our two inner section columns are built the same way. They have a pricing list element. When you add this element, you can set however many items you want it to contain. In my case, how many dishes will fit in one column. You can click on each item to open its settings. So each dish is one item and you can customize them here. If you want to remove one, just click on this X to the side. 
And if you want to make a copy of it, click on this paper stack icon. Then you can add a brand new item by clicking on the add item button. You can also pick the H tag for your item titles. I'm going to leave the themes default H6. Then you can pick the title color and price color. Okay, now I can start changing my item content, starting with the title. Okay, now update. Let's check the front. Refresh to see the change. There, my restaurant's brand new menu. Now, this button underneath, it's in a separate section. The button options themselves don't differ much from those we've already seen, so I won't be going into them. But this section is interesting on its own. When we click to edit it and go to the advanced settings, we can see that there is a background pattern added as SVG. The same principle that we had for the SVG column before applies here as well. Namely, you can change the color by locating the hex code and replacing it, which I will do now, just a sec. Okay, there's the color I've been using. Update. Then you can pick whether this pattern will show on the left or the right side of the section. You can customize its offset if you don't want it to disappear off the edge of the screen. So, if I remove this, the pattern shifts so it's not cut off by the edge of the screen. I'll return it to the way it was, but you can adjust its position by adding pixels or percentages here. Now, let's see how my new pattern color looks on the front end. Refresh. Okay, nice. The section after this one is one with three columns added to the inner section. Here we have elements that are already familiar to us. The first two columns are single image elements, and the third column contains a section title element. Since we've already seen the th settings for all three, I'll just quickly replace the images without going into all the options. Now we can update and check the front end. Okay, doing well. There's only the section title content left, so I'll replace the dummy text in it. The tagline can stay, but I'll change the title. The new one can be innovation. And I will replace the text with something more meaningful. You'll each have your own thing, of course, but I want you to get a sense of how it looks when you have text in a language you can read and understand. Okay, update. And refresh the page. There we are. We have two new images, we have text that makes sense, section done. We're doing really well. The next thing we have is this parallax image with a video button. This is actually built using one element only, the video button. The image in the background is just a section background image, special effects aside. You can add a link to your video here. It can be from YouTube or Vimeo, wherever it's hosted. You can set an image for it, but since we already have one in our section, it probably wouldn't look good. And you can change the button color if you need it to match the image you set as your section background. Speaking of the background image, let me show you how that's set. Edit section, then go to the advanced options. Find the Laurent Parallax section. This is where you can replace the demo image, which I'm going to do right away. Just a moment so I can find the one I prepared. When picking an image that will have parallax effects, keep in mind that it should have a greater height than the section, so as you scroll, more of the image can be revealed. Okay, that one. Insert media. Then update. And finally, check the front. Refresh. Okay, there's my new image. I now have the parallax effect on my own image and I didn't touch any of the settings since they fit my needs. And the video button works normally. And that's it. The following section is, well, the one immediately after is a section title and we already know how that one works. So I'll simply replace the tagline to reflect my restaurant's name. But the title can stay, so update. And let's see the front end. Okay, now we have the offer at Avalon. So we can head over to the next section. You might be thinking images again, but no, this is a portfolio list element. So a whole new bunch of settings, like the list template. This is the gallery layout, but you can change that to masonry. Then you can choose what happens when someone clicks on one of the featured images. You can have portfolio singles open as a page 
or you can have them open in pretty photos, which means users will get something like an image gallery while staying on the same page. You can decide how many columns will be shown. As we can see, it's three right now, but you can increase that number. Once you've done that, you can set the space between items. This, what we have now, is 20 pixels. You can make it bigger or smaller or remove it entirely if you like. Then you can pick how many portfolio singles will be shown. Right now it's 3, but you can change that to your preference. And you can change the image proportions using this drop-down. I'm leaving it as original because it displays my images as they are when I upload them. We also have the option to enable image shadow here. Again, my background is dark, so I don't think it'll work for me. Now, this is important. Using this option allows you to make a portfolio list that will show only one category of portfolio singles. So, if you want your list to show just one category, you need to type it in here. Or you can choose to display only certain portfolio singles by listing their ID numbers. Or we can set a list display that would show only singles that have a specific tag on them. But since I'm using the category as the qualifier for my list, then I won't need these two. Finally, we have the order by and order options, both of which you can change if you want. Then in content layout options, the item style is the standard overlay, which gives us an overlay when we hover over a single. And you can add a top margin to give yourself some more space if you need it. The same goes for the content bottom, if you'd like some space below the categories here. Then we can see that content title is enabled. That's this here, starters. It's actually the title of the individual portfolio single. You can turn it off if you like, and you can change the title tag if you want. Then the title text transform option. The default is uppercase, we can see that the title is shown in all caps. And showing the category is enabled, so it's visible here below the title. Oh, enable excerpt is turned off. If you'd like to display more information about your portfolio items, you can enable the excerpt here. And after that, the additional features. Here we have a few interesting options like the pagination type. This is useful to enable if your portfolio list is on a slider. And the category filter is great if you have multiple singles and want to let your visitors filter which ones they want to see. Those filters will be displayed above your singles. And finally, enable article animation is on. It gives our singles an appearing effect. That's best seen on the front. When I refresh the page, we get this. This gentle slide from the bottom animation. I like it so it can stay. Now, before we go further, I want to replace the featured images in my portfolio singles. It's the quickest way to affect change on the home page. You, of course, will have to do more extensive customization on your end, since you need to add text, your own images, and more. So, let's open the portfolio singles so you can see how they look from the back. This is a view of all the available portfolio singles. They all come with the demo content. And when I hover over a name, there's no edit with element or option. This is no reason to panic. You simply have to enable your portfolio singles for editing with Elementor. This is often the case with page builders. They don't have all post types enabled for editing by default. To change this, simply go to Elementor in your menu, then Settings. And under Post Types, be sure to tick Laurent Portfolio. In fact, tick anything you want to edit with Elementor that's not already included. You can then use this to build things from scratch with Elementor or customize existing demo content. And since I'm here, I'll also tick the products. Then go to Save Changes. I've ticked all my post types to make sure that whatever I choose to do, Elementor is there to help me. Now that I've sorted that out, I can get back to my portfolio singles. And I want to find the ones we saw in the portfolio list. So I'm looking through the categories. There, specialties. Let's open the first one. Now, our portfolio singles backend has more or less the same options as a regular page backend, so there's no need for us to go through those again. Instead, let me just replace the featured image here, remove the old one, and set a new one. Upload, select, and just a sec, it's this one. Open, and finally, set featured image. There it is. We can now update the page and then go to the front to refresh. Ok, everything worked as it should. There's another thing I wanted to show you with your portfolio singles. 
you have this option to upload additional images that will also be displayed on the portfolio single page. Actually, best I show you how it looks, it'll be much clearer. We can use the link here. Ok, this is our portfolio single page, and the three images from the back are here in this slider, so keep in mind you'll need to replace them too when you're customizing your site. I'm skipping this now because we've seen how image upload works, and unlike the featured image, these aren't visible directly on my homepage. Another thing I wanted to show you here is the option to choose your portfolio single type, that's here in elated portfolio settings. As you can see, we have quite a few options to choose from. I'm going to show you what some of them look like using the live theme demo rather than go back and forth here. I'll open the demo for the same homepage we're working on. Ok. Now here in portfolio, we have portfolio single in the second level and specific single showcase in the third level. So starting with the first one, here the images are on the left and the information and descriptions follow you as you scroll down and all the content fits within the grid. The images themselves are on the smaller side, hence the name small images. The next one is small slider. Same images, only this time in a slider so users don't have to scroll and all the information is right there. Then large slider. The images are still in a slider but larger so they take up the entire width of the page and the description is right below them. After that we have large images. The images take up the entire width of the grid again, but they are arrayed across the length of the page, and the information is once again at the bottom. And finally, gallery. This portfolio single type displays multiple images in a sort of gallery in two rows, so for this type you should make sure to upload enough images. And that's it for our portfolio type choices, I can close this up now. And we can move on to editing our portfolio single. So we need to click on the edit with Elementor button here. Even though we enabled editing the Laurent portfolio using Elementor, some things like this slider can't be changed from here. That's because we use the image gallery option in the backend to upload the images. Then, here we have the portfolio title. And to its right are these breadcrumbs, so we can see where we are on the site. Then this element here, it's actually a plain heading. This is where you can change the title, and pick its size. Then decide on its H tag, and finally adjust the alignment. It's left by default, but you can change that. And if you want, you can make it clickable by setting a link here. Underneath that, we have two text editor elements. When you select one, you will immediately get these settings where you can replace the content. Simply type over the current dummy text. The same applies to the second text editor element. If you want to get a specific layout or split paragraphs so you can customize them separately, you can stack several text editor elements as we see here. In fact, you can stack all kinds of elements, it's all up to your design and how you can make it happen. Then below that we have these items with information about the portfolio single. All of them are automatically generated, so you don't have to lift a finger. These simply display some of the things you set in the page backend, like these tags. Let me show you. When you open your portfolio single, here on the right you get settings for categories and tags. Our portfolio single belongs to the specialties category, but you can change that by selecting any of the other categories. And you can add tags here, simply start typing to find what you need. If you can't find the right tag, you can make a new one. In the portfolio list options, you can see all the tags you have thanks to the theme. If you need more tags, you can make them the same way you make categories. Give it a name and copy it for the slug, then go to add new portfolio tag. And you'll have a new tag. After that, you can add it to your portfolio singles. It's very simple, start typing and you'll get suggestions for matching tags. Click on the one that fits and go to add. And whichever tags you add in the back will show up here on the front. And share. Which social networks are shown depends on which ones you connected to your site. It's set in the themes global options but I'll leave you a link in the description to a tutorial for connecting your Instagram and your Twitter account. Ok, now that we've seen what we can do with our portfolio single, I'm going to quickly replace the rest of the featured images visible on the front. That's these two. I can close this, and this, 
a lot of these. Then I can open my next single to replace its featured image. You already know how that goes, so let's skip ahead. And there we are, all new featured images. Remember, I'm cutting some corners now, but you'll need to replace the images and descriptions in your portfolio singles. Then we have the reservation form section. That's, whoops, overshot it. That's this section which has another background pattern in it. Select the section for editing, go to advanced, and let's change its color to match the rest of the design. Again, it's very simple, you just need to replace the color's hex code to do this. There we are, update. Now let's check the front end to see how things look over there. Okay. In terms of elements, we have a section title here, already seen. So let's take a look at the reservation form below it. Here in small print, we can see powered by OpenTable. To get this functionality, you need to make an account with OpenTable. It's entirely free. And you get an OpenTable ID. This will get you access to the restaurant reservation tool, which then lets you edit the form. The things you can change in Elementor are the layout. Keep in mind that the inline that's selected now is stylized to match the theme. And the form field skin. The default is dark, but you can change it to light. The change is very discreet, and you can't see it, but it will be more visible with a different color scheme if you opt for one. And since my update button is active, let me update just in case. And while I'm at it, take a peek at the front. Okay. Now this form itself comes from OpenTable, so there's not much you can change here. It's stylized by the theme, so you get matching fonts and a compatible color palette, as well as a button with the same style as all the rest. And finally, we've reached our page footer. Much like the header, the footer is customized in the theme's general options. So, Laurent options and footer. Right away, we can see that the footer is set to be in grid. So we get this neat, compact look on the front. Then we have the show footer top option. It's enabled and gives us this space where we put our footer content. In terms of layout, we can see our footer is centered and has one column. So it looks like this. But you can shift its alignment to the left or right and add more columns for your content if you need to. And we can customize the footer top styles. So you can change your footer's background color, its border color and its border width. If we take a look at the front, we can see that there's no border, but that's because we have an exemption set in the page-specific settings so it won't show on the home page. If you remove the exemption, then you'll get a line between your footer and the page content, exactly like we had between the header and the page content. And show footer bottom is disabled, but you can enable it to get more space here below. Now let's take a look at how all this content can be customized. The footer is filled with widgets, so you need to go to your dashboard and find Appearance Widgets. Here you need to find the footer top column 1 widget area. And here are all the widgets I have in my footer. The image contains the old logo, so I'll replace it with my own. I'll use the same image I set in the side area, so I don't need to upload a new one, this one is already in my media library. There, okay. And the link below, I'll copy my homepage URL and set it here. Save. Now refresh the page to check. My logo's there. Then the next widget is a separator. Separators are usually added to provide some sort of buffer between other content-filled widgets. And we have 35 pixels giving us this space here. After that, the text widget. Here I'm just going to replace the restaurant's name. Avalon. And save. Let's see it now. Refresh. There we have it. The Avalon restaurant. And below this is another text widget. This time with an address and email with a mail to link. You can edit the link by clicking on the little pencil and change the email simply by typing over it. There. OK. Save. And refresh. There it is. Avalon. And that's all folks. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please drop us a line in the comments below. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel and be the first to learn about new theme guides and tutorials.